So, dude, Hollywood is upside down. The yeah. strike is destroying everything. <laughs> What's your take on that? How do you feel about it? Like, now SAG is also joining. Yeah. So, it's weird because it's my first strike, going, like, going through it and, like, really, like, living in it. So, I'm, like, learning, like, new things every single day. Because, uh, you know, in the 2008 strike, we, we, we weren't really in. We were little kids. And we were little kids. So, it's kind of like, okay, how do you what's happening what are the terminologies and now you're and now you're mixing like social media with it now which is like really like heavy i don't know i just wish it was over i wish just pay people you know i, I don't think writers are asking or even actors now like they're not asking like half of the profits they're just asking livable wages and i think that's important especially like with the cost of inflation especially in la it's really expensive here so i just really it's 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 just it's so hard to think about because it's like what all of these like executives are saying and like they're saying like it's unrealistic which is like that's crazy because but how do you think they can actually fix it because i look at it from the side mm -hmm. of like as a producer yeah so when you look at the business models that the studios have is very different from the model that we used to have before because mm. of the streaming the streaming yeah. yes so I think they're asking for about 450 to 500 million dollars more every year. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I don't like, like I'm all about writers getting paid and every, and the actors getting paid and everyone making money. Yeah. The thing that I think people are missing is we are not making the same amount of money with the content that we used to do when it was running on cable, cable or network yeah. and getting advertising. Yeah, I think maybe that's what it is because it was kind of I, I don't know if you remember that that time when you saw one streamer pop up right and then you saw another like it was like netflix and hulu they were kind of like the biggest ones and then mm -hmm. now you're seeing all the like paramount plus uh peacock peacock uh every like cbs disney disney plus and so it it grew i think they it grew so fast and they didn't know that it was going to grow so fast and now I think it's it's just internally like how do they they're saying how do we calculate like funding and and money and all of that internally but if you're not releasing the data how can we how can we know that you're telling the truth so i, I see so yeah. it's more a matter of trusting that what they're saying that they're making is actually what they're yeah. making but don't they have earnings report because they work as a public company exactly so that's so that I, that's not my peer purview because you know i'm a writer but like i'm thinking maybe it's probably either like all of these streamers are conjoining and like not being so little like because i don't know how they're sustaining um because they keep raising their prices but yeah they, and they're raising their prices because they're actually losing money when they're losing money so. yeah so when the when the reports came out netflix was the only one reporting earnings on the green everyone mm. else was on the red everyone else was losing money yeah. with the streaming because they're pushing a lot of marketing dollars to get people to sign up for the subscription mm -hmm. so i'm just concerned that not everyone is thinking about the actual economics mm -hmm. of how it works and when you get into distribution, it's not as easy as, oh, because the studio is making all of this money, mm -hmm. it means that they have to pay all of the writers that work on their projects a lot of money. And because the exec is making a lot of money, it doesn't mean that the show that that writer worked on made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So making that a balance, it's just more difficult than I think people understand. Yeah, and, and that's why I don't really, like, you know, like on social media or whatever, I don't really comment on that front because I I can't comment on something that I don't know. I'm I'm very ignorant of that part of, like, the, the process and, um, like, streaming and, and, and the money. Um, it's just, it is crazy to see actor residuals and, and all of that because I, I know they're, they're two different unions. Um, that's just wild. Like, I, I don't know if you just saw like Mandy Moore, like she just came out with like, this is us, right? She said like her residual, her last res res residual check uh, for this is us was like in the pennies. Wow. And I'm like, wait, like that was like one of NBC. And that was, that wasn't a streamer. Like that was a network, but people were watching it on Netflix though. Maybe that could be the thing. I don't. And also it's, it's hard nowadays to watch TV live. 
Well, nobody, nobody, nobody does, does it, right? Because you remember, like back in the day, like you had to like go home at a certain time to watch TV, and like I think that's how they calculate it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think we just they just need to find a new system. Like I, I feel like the whole rating system and like all of that, it's just so it's just so dated. It's so old. They're, they're, I feel like a lot of times Hollywood still operate like like they're in the fifties. They do, which is very surprising. When I was working on on the show for Amazon, I worked when I first came to LA. I worked on a show called Dem Covenant mm-hmm. for Amazon. Yeah, yeah. From I remember you came. Yeah, yeah, you I came, came, I came when we set, were shooting, which was crazy. I didn't even know they were shooting that because you couldn't really tell me what they were shooting. But yeah, yes. My tattoo documentary Literary Inc is streaming now on all platforms. If you love stories, documentaries, and especially if you love tattoos and Harry Potter, this movie is just for you. Check out Literary Inc streaming now on. On all major platforms a lot of the logistics side of it is still like paper we're printing our time sheets mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. we're doing everything like paper based all the contracts are like signed on paper yeah. a lot of the operations of the studio are done the old school way and the thing is it's complicated to understand the accounting of the studio system mm-hmm. and they are under a lot of scrutiny so everyone likes to say oh the studio has creative accounting in hollywood they make the money disappear Mm. and then they're gonna like move the money here move the money there yeah it's way harder to do that than what you would think i mean it's still done and it's just because in production you can allocate budgets at a different rates Mm. and you can say okay i'm gonna park this money here and then i'm gonna move it from the transportation budget to the wardrobe or the set deck it's a lot of moving pieces but the writing fees and all of that that's pretty set in stone before you go into production Mm -hmm. so you can't really like skim the writers if they have good negotiation and their agents at the beginning of the deal they are signing those contracts yeah so i just want people to have responsibility from both sides and i know i'm gonna get a I get into a lot of trouble on Twitter for speaking about this. Mm -hmm. And then people go past what I'm trying to say that is more complicated than we might see from the outside. And then they go straight to the hate. Oh, you're like an ex, you have exec swag and you just think that the studio is this and that. I think, I mean, I think transparency is, is, is needed for everybody. Um, Again, like as, I guess you could consider me a baby screenwriter because I haven't uh, sold my first one yet, but... um, Well, but you did sell your novel. I did sell my novel, yeah. Yeah, I did that, but, it, you know, I... Yeah, transparency and just... And really, like, if they're making millions of dollars and, like, they... And I guess it's more so on the back end. Maybe that's the conversation that actors and and writers are having. It's more so on the back end. Yes, they Um, they want the residuals and people uh, are conflating the AI issues and the AI new yeah. technology, yeah. like that is the problem. That's not really the problem. The problem is the residual income that is coming to the writers mm-hmm. because all of the streaming companies and now the big studios and cable companies are moving to a subscription service. You only pay like whatever you pay for Netflix. If you watch 20 movies, is the same amount of money. Mm-hmm. If you watch 50 movies, is the same amount of money. So maybe that's why they were like coming out with like ad supported. Uh, that's what they have options. to do to raise their income. So now, hopefully that trickles down to the writers and actors better than if, if, if that's the route that they're going. Yes, it should be. Yeah. Now the challenge is you have so many people that touch a project. Mm-hmm. So the writer is always going to get a very small percentage. Every time, yeah. But that happens for the directors and for the music people because you have to split. Imagine like that pie, you have to split it like, with yeah. everyone. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're going to get like a, the writer won't get 20% of whatever that is bringing in. Mm-hmm. It's going to get way, way, way less than that. Yeah. Now tell me about you in the process of writing your novel. Mm-hmm. How did that work? Like how does that those deals work? Um, just as far as like selling it. Yeah. Uh, so once you uh, get the sale. Yeah. So, um, it's, you know, writing a novel, the, the publishing and Hollywood, even though they work hand in hand, a lot of times, um, it's two totally different industries, um, which is something that I'm, I'm actively learning right now. 
Um, How big was that check, Ladarian? That's, I, that's what we all want to know. Um, I can't. You can't mm, say. I can't no, say. Don't but me. I get to write full time, be a full time creative now. Which, that's my dude. Thank God. That uh, <laughs> yo, let let's take a moment. Yeah, that is huge, man. That's huge. Yeah, like it's that been, is huge. I've been writing since I was seventeen, and age thirty, I get to write full time uh, and be a full time creative. Without I'm so any, happy for yeah, you, man. I'm I, so happy for you because I know this is this is it for you. Yeah, it is. It's it's just been a wild journey. Um, because you know, um, obviously I wrote this book, this young adult fantasy novel or the series now. Um, it's because it's a trilogy. Um, I wrote it um in 2020. You know when everything was shutting down and and everything. So I wrote it and I wrote it as a TV script. Uh, Cause I was like, I'm thinking like, oh, this idea is really cool. Um, it's about a kid, you know, he goes to a magical school and you know, everybody loves that. And so I wrote it as a TV pilot thinking that I was going to sell it um, or, or get me staffed, at least get me staffed or, or repped. And cause at the time I wasn't repped by anybody. Um, and so in 2020 I did that. And then it got me like my first manager um, and got me meetings and I was going on generals and generals for the entire year but you know it was it was covid things wasn't really moving around um by 2021 i really became um really depressed with it and kind of wrestling with it because i was like i have this idea everybody is saying it's good we even wrote the you know we even filmed this uh this, the this short film the yeah. teaser and we filmed it during covid and we were safe very safe nobody got sick and we had something special i, I really believe that in my heart 100 percent and like 2021, things just wasn't happening. I was seeing everybody get stabbed. And, you know, when we were really kind of coming out of the COVID thing, everybody, it felt like everybody was getting stabbed. And so, and here I have the script. I was having literally a uh, studio heads like, oh yeah, reading the script, you're ready. You're ready to be stabbed. You're ready to sell a show. Yeah. And then ghost, you know, and then like just radio silence. And so um, in that like really hard truth of it, I decided to adapt it into a book. Um, just, I always wanted to write a book. Um, I just didn't know how. And so, but the first draft of the book really flowed out of me. I wrote the first draft in like 12 days. I, uh, I literally locked myself into it in an apartment and, and just, just, wrote. just wrote it because it just flowed out of me. And um, I was like, okay, I got this book. I don't know. Because sometimes even publishing, publishing is kind of. I think publishing is as difficult. It's that as difficult to TV. break in, and and it's just and and they were they were having their own problems with like you know type of books and representation, um in that in the especially in the young adult fantasy or young adult genre period. But um I wrote it and then I kind of got it together um for the first few months and um started going out on querying. Uh, I queried a lot of agents, and that means when you know you submit your book mm -hmm. to agents like the first maybe five pages or 10 pages or 15, sometimes up to 50. And you wait and you wait and you wait until you either get a yes or a no. How were you able to like stay committed to it during all that time? Because at that time, what were you doing for work? I was doing Uber. I was doing Lyft. Um, I was door dashing um, and I was writing my my script or my book and during that during that time as well like in the car like i would have my my stuff on the passenger seat and just write during between rides um it was i can't say it was easy it was very difficult it was a, a lot of nights of just i don't know like you know you're thinking i don't know if this is going to make it i because you know especially with a book like that i wrote like i don't i just didn't know that it was going to make it um and, and because i was still kind of feeling and tasting the bitterness of the, the the pilot script not making it yeah so i had to really mentally i had to really fight through it um did you did you feel like maybe you had to go like quit on it and go back go back home? that's the thing i couldn't quit i couldn't i couldn't quit on this particular story you know you writers know when you have that one particular story that you cannot give up on i couldn't it kept bother it would bother me at night it would bother me during the day when i'm just driving around la um and so i knew i i knew that this story it had to be told so um i i use that as fuel um that 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 need that that fire that i had to tell this story i use that as fuel and so um, Why does it matter so much to you? Because I grew up when I was in high school, um, 
I grew up, we all grew up in the, in the era of like, you know, you know, when they were adapting all the YA dystopian novels, like they were adapting Twilight and, and, and Divergent and Hunger Games. And even one of my favorite book series, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Um, for me, I, even though I love those stories and I grew up reading them in high school, I didn't really see somebody that looked like me in those stories. Um, and as the hero, I wanted to, I want, I wanted to see, I wanted to write something about, or about a character that looked that looked like me during that time. And so I was, I knew that it was important for the 17 year old version of Ladarian to write this book. And that's what, I, that's what really made me keep fighting for it. Um, and, and maybe that, and maybe out there again, there's somebody out there like we, we want this type of story. We want this type of story. Um, and so I, I use that as fuel to like keep fighting. Yeah. You have, the, you have to write it because yeah. it's for you. That's yeah. the, the, the projects that you actually can make are the ones that you are making for mm -hmm. you. I remember when I did my, my second feature, it was like a whole year of editing. Like I, I did mm. the, the whole shooting, it was a documentary and I used to, I was working at a TV show for Apple TV and it, I was doing like, f I was a location scout full, full time, yeah. full time, full tw time yeah. 12 hour days. And I used to wake up early and just edit the movie for like maybe an hour mm -hmm. and like try to get something done. And then on the weekends I would edit more. And yeah. then sometimes at night I will come and like put in a couple of hours and like just, mm. and the editing is, is so. Thank God for editors. Yeah. yeah. So difficult. Yeah. And I have one scene, there's one scene in the movie where one of my best friends, he goes back to Cuba to see his family. Mm -hmm. And he has this moment with his mom. And then he goes on this field and he's just walking on this field. Mm. And it's like this like savanna yeah. of like yeah. beautiful field. And like I, every time I felt like, fuck my life, like I don't want to keep editing this movie. I would go and just play that play that, that one scene. Yeah. And then like I'm I'm, I'm getting emotional, yeah. man. Like that would get me through. That would get you through it, yeah. Um, that was your anchor. Yeah. Your anchor to we all I feel like every creative should have one. Have that if it's a I don't know, if it's a picture or break I don't know, bracelet, whatever it is, or or something really um tangible to have is as as that anchor and like and the fact that you also like the fact that you were editing something that it started off as an idea and then it started you know, it came from nothing. And now you're in the editing bay. Like you're literally at the last stage yeah. before it goes out into the world. Yeah. So that that was your anchor. You got to see something come to pass. Like, you know, a lot of people don't get to that point. We don't get to the editing bay and like yeah. and grinding it out and grinding it out. Like, oh, why is this scene not working? Or why is this transition not working? You know, or whatever. Uh, and what, you know about that because when you did your your Katrina film. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, I that was my first a short film that I filmed out here, um, which was based off a play. Um, Katrina is about two people trapped in a, a hospital room during Hurricane Katrina. Um, and it started off as a, one of my first plays ever I've written in when I was 17. And um, when I came to LA, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, I just, and a director, I just didn't know how, cause you know, I, I started off as a writer. I didn't, I didn't think I could be in the director's chair. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think that was possible until I had to make it myself. And that was during a time where um, I had to say yes to myself. And so I got some friends. I It was weird hiring a cinematographer and sound and 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 finding a location. It's complicated, right? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I, I don't want to do whoever does this for actual films. God bless you, because yeah. I, I can't do it. Because um, that's the producer. So you ended up producing, producing and directing and, and, and writing. And writing it. And so I had to find like a like a hospital room in L.A. to Because, you know, I couldn't go to Louisiana to actually film it. Mm -hmm. um, and so doing that, I really got I was like, oh, I'm a I'm a director now. I, could, I get to call myself that because I, I grew up. I remember growing up and watching movies. And then, you know, back in those days, they had like the, the feature at back behind the scenes and you get to see like the camera move and the director like you know they do like this this uh b-roll of the director like directing and i've always wanted to do that i just didn't think it was possible and so um yeah i got to film my first short film which was which was crazy 
That's great, man. Yeah. Well, I remember you and I met in college mm -hmm. about 11 years ago. Oh, my gosh. In Cleveland, Tennessee at yeah. the university. Mm -hmm. And I remember you sent me your first uh, pilot. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. I appreciate that because it was my first. You read like one of my first drafts because um, I, I, I was such a playwright and I was an actor, too. I, I was really heavy into acting. And I really, I loved TV. I've always loved TV and watching. And that's when like Hulu was kind of becoming big and Netflix was really getting really big. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would watch all TV, like pilot scripts. And I would, I would always study the pilot episode without even thinking about it. Like I would always go back and watch the pilot. Hmm. Um, for those who don't know what a pilot is, that's the first episode of a TV series, right? So um, I... I was like, well, I want to write my own TV show, especially like something in the fantasy genre, but also make it very contemporary, contemporary and based in the South, because, you know, we were in the South in Tennessee and all of that. So I I downloaded um, I literally Googled because, uh, you know, I, we was at a college, but we wasn't like we didn't have like all the resources that that are available today. Um, so I Googled True Blood uh, pilot script PDF and I found it. I was like, wait, this is what an actual TV script looks like? Because, you know, you never yeah. know what a TV script And you were writing, at that time, you were writing on Microsoft Word, right? Yeah, I was writing in Microsoft Word. I didn't yeah. even know what Final Draft was, like, yeah. until, like, I don't even remember who told me what Final, what, like, because I think it was also Adobe Spark was, like, a thing. Yes. Or Creative, or Adobe Creative or something. It, it was, was, like, something. free. Yeah, I remember, I, I think I told you about it. Yeah, I, you told me about the Adobe, because yeah. I was like, I can't afford three hundred dollars for yes final and, drive and adobe had one uh that it was great but then uh adobe story story but then they they just they, it just went away and then all the scripts it. that i wrote in it was gone to whatever uh, <laughs> so i wrote i ba based off that script that i found i wrote my first uh pilot script and then i was like okay like i was adding all the cut twos and the dirt like the camera pans left um mm -hmm. yeah, you know just like it's just a lot of amateur stuff and then i shared it with you and he was like oh this is actually good and i was like okay uh so am i tv writer yet <laughs> so no but you know you have to rewrite and get mm -hmm. feedback and so but yeah that was 2013 like my first TV script, which I moved out here in 2015 mm -hmm. with, with, like, you know, as my sample to prove to Hollywood that, hey, I could write a script as well. So, yeah. And now you have been here for a while mm -hmm. and it hasn't been an easy ride. No. I no. know that it has been one of the, like, you are one of the people that I know that has worked harder for, like, what they want mm -hmm. from anyone else that I know, from any other writer that I know. Mm -hmm. You are the writer that I know has been through a lot more difficulties and struggles and still kept kept going, yeah. Kept your drive and your stories and yeah. you keep writing and keep writing and keep writing. Yeah, it was hard because also I was still holding on to the fact that I was a playwright, screenwriter, filmmaker and all that. And after I filmed the, my first short film, I literally thought that was it. Like, okay, you can't tell me nothing. I have a short film. I have a pilot script. I had a, and then I, at that point I was writing a few other pilots and a features script and I have plays. So I was like, okay, I have all the material to be a TV writer or a filmmaker. Where's the yes. Do you think that maybe you should have done it differently instead of oh, jumping? Gosh. If so, let's go back. Yeah. If you had to go back and do it all over again mm. with everything that you know now, mm. And if you had Ooh. to move to LA now in 2023 mm -hmm. as a writer, yeah, how would you do things? Oh my gosh, um, I definitely would have. Well, I would have filmed all my short films back home because I could have got locations for free. I could have gotten, I could have gotten more help um, as far as like cutting budget costs, you know, like and really and also really learning the art of filmmaking because for me. The only, the only reason I learned how to write a script was because I couldn't afford like the classes at UCLA or USC. So I had to go on like their website to figure out what books they study. And I ordered them off of Amazon and that's how I taught my way. Um, and you could have basically done that back home. I could have done that back home. I feel I would have changed. I would have let for me, I would have let a lot of things marinate a little bit more instead of being so impulsive and jumping into things. And sometimes you do have to be. You would just have to jump in it Some, because if you're not, then you're not going to do it. But um, as far as um, really developing the craft of 
screenwriting and outlining instead of just not outlining. Yeah, you like to sit down and just go. Just go. Um, and sometimes that gets me in trouble in the rewriting phase. Um, and so I would really, I really wish I had the tools that I have now back then. And I would, I would just, I would learn to let things marinate a little bit more instead of jumping into every little thing so prematurely because I was coming from a place of, well, they're telling me no, they're telling me no, so I got to do it myself. That Yes, you, you sometimes you do have to film things on your own to, just to learn and, and just to figure out like what a set is like or what a camera does or what how actors. Yeah, you know, I remember that. I told you yeah. not to do it. I yeah. remember we had a conversation and you were trying to do one of the shorts and I was like, no, like don't don't use those resources on mm -hmm. the short because the short won't get you the feature. Mm -hmm. Keep working on the script for the feature. Yeah. And then when you sell it, let someone else direct your first feature. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have a feature that is already produced. Mm -hmm. And then when you get staffed on a, on a show as a writer, you will move your way up and then you get to direct when you don't have to also fund everything, yeah. produce everything find the editor yeah, like struggle that's a through lot. that's a lot to do on more per one person mm -hmm. um and it's expensive you don't realize how like when people you know you know family or friends back home they like when's the next short film coming or when's the next podcast coming? they don't realize how expensive mm -hmm. it is yeah, i mean it's hard just to live and pay rent and pay it, for food yeah like I, it's either food or film and the right now we love film and we love sh doing shorts but I can't go to a grocery store and say, hey, I have a short film. Can I get $200 worth of groceries? Mm -hmm. Just It's just not going to happen, right? So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, going back, I, I, I really do wish I would let things just develop more, develop myself more. And I probably would have been ahead, more ahead than I am now. Or, you know, you just never know, like, the path that, that, that it was, you know, sought out for you. So I would definitely let things just marinate a little bit more. What would you sell? What would you tell the young Ladarian that was like back home when you were like saving up and working yeah. uh, at a restaurant and like saving up oh, your gosh. money? Oh gosh! What working, would you tell that guy? At Taco Bell. Um, well, first, when you first move out here to LA, yes, it's gonna be scary. Don't don't worry. It's a new city. That's okay. Find your tribe early. Don't think you could do it all alone because like filmmaking is a collaborative art. You collaborate with actors, producers, directors, cinematographers, lighting. They all, they're all there to make your project. So really find your tribe early and lean on them and let them lean on you. I, it's just, that's what, it, that's what the word is coming to me. Like l just l live in it more like be, yes, be an artist, but really study the craft and don't be so fast to like go make stuff or send stuff out. Don't send stuff out so prematurely. Really work on your like your your scripts and do a few drafts in, and then also workshop it. Like I feel like I don't know. I can't speak for every screenwriter, but I feel like screenwriters really get some actor friends and workshop their scripts because you know you're writing it, you're writing it. You don't really hear it out loud. Yeah, I think because you have done so many plays. Yeah, to you that's normal. That's, that's part normal. Of the process. So like getting a script and once you get it to a a, a you know a decent place that you feel comfortable sharing get some actor friends like get some snacks and go to, go to somebody's house or their house or your house um and just read the script out loud and really take notes and 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 also listen to actors because these are going to be the people that are going to be breathing life into the character so really listen to actors and 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 you know you don't have to accept every single feedback because not everybody's feedback is going to be right and also it, it's ultimately your choice because it's your script um, really, really do that and really workshop it before you start sending things out. That's something I, I wish I learned first because you're so like, when you come out here, you're so green and you're so new, you just want to, you just want to be seen. You want to, you want to be heard. You want to be, um, you want to be seen as like, oh, I'm talented too. Just like every other 10,000 people in the city. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, really just don't be so quick to send your stuff out. Yeah. Just let it just just let it marinate. <laughs> what do you think about the city in general? Uh, L.A. Mm. Yeah. What, what are you on, on the love hate spectrum? Uh, the hate is like rent is crazy out here. Like 
I, I hear like it's so funny. I don't know if you do this with like friends or family back home. I don't. <laughs> yeah, when they when they I complain don't. about their rent, they're like, "Oh my gosh, my I can't believe I'm paying like like nine hundred dollars for a two bedroom." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's insane." You know how much a two bedroom averaging out here in L.A. like you're gonna play, pay close to like what three grand? Yeah. Um, it, but it's it's it goes to show like that little thing is goes to show like how different the work like difference of the of your world is like from back home wherever you're from Mm -hmm. um that but the love of it here is i mean obviously like the view like i can't get this back home sometimes but it's it's just it's home now like you you find your little and la is la is you may it may seem like this big city but it's like little pockets of like neighborhoods Mm -hmm. and you're gonna find your neighborhood like north hollywood or koreatown or Mm -hmm. Um, Santa Monica and you're going to find that little neighborhood and you're going to just thrive in it because it's it's for me it's home now like it's I don't see myself moving away like this is this is my home yeah same for me Hollywood is like I I, I couldn't imagine yeah. living anywhere else than Hollywood and like yeah. the most amazing people that I've met in my life are That's here Hollywood. and I, we love Hollywood, but I don't know. <laughs> for me, I don't know I'm living in it. Um, but some people like it. Yeah. Some people love ho- like actually living in like the city of Hollywood. I you know? love it, man. Yeah. I, I, I go and walk by the boulevard. Yeah, and you just dream, right? You know, you're just like, wow, this is cr-. like Yeah, dude, think about it. This place, people have been making movies here for 100 years. Years, yeah. Like streets, you know, like streets that you walk on, like you, you never know what famous movie or tv show yeah. that and it's and it's so weird like you know you watch tv shows like you know that that moment when you're watching a tv show and you're like oh, oh shit that's yeah. that's lancashire boulevard or shit that's sunset boulevard that's west hollywood like that's that's i feel like that's so amazing to to be on the outside and and, and also being like you know like you you know you're from cuba i'm from alabama and like coming like a like a world of like of, of like distance and in coming into the city and and really living and thriving here um and it takes a while it takes a like you're not i don't know everybody's experience but from my experience it took me a few years to kind of get in the groove of this city mm-hmm. um and learning like okay like the the freeways and the the knowing that the south okay south that means like downtown and usc and west is like you like you learn like the little you know like little pockets of the city yeah. which is beautiful you learn it but i feel like once you learn it for people like us like mm-hmm. you have to be a little bit crazy to love hollywood mm-hmm. i mean that it is what it is yeah but then the crazies thrive here so yeah, yeah. i mean that we're artists so yeah. you know they say we're the craziest apparently we are man so <laughs> if you could do anything in life and you had all the money and all the time, what would you do? I literally, I literally would be making films. I, I mean, I can't see myself doing any, doing anything else, but just making films uh, with my friends and, and I don't know. Yeah. That's just it. Being a creative, like writing plays and going to put them up and, and writing shorts and, or I don't know, maybe doing features. If I had all the money in the world, like, Sometimes you don't, you know, you don't have to wait on a studio to give you that green light. Maybe if I had all the money in the world, I'd be like, okay, hey guys, let's get together and let's shoot this feature. Um, yeah, I can't see myself doing anything else. I just, it's just destined for me, I believe, that to be a, a creative, to be an artist, um, filmmaker, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. If you liked it, check out this other episode with my buddy Marcus. He's also a writer, and I think you're gonna enjoy his episode very much.